Perfect timing like always, Sharon. New Age 
or whatever your criticism of doing what God invited us to do might be. But what God invites us to do is to love God with all that we are. Love our neighbor as ourself, which requires what? To really genuinely love ourselves and take care of ourselves. So we're going to do that together in worship. To make more room, we're going to focus on decluttering and lightening up our lives. And this week, we focus on finding the rhythms of life that feed us, finding just the right tempo. Each week we'll sing verses of this song, Come and Find the Quiet Center, a beautiful poem uh, to a familiar hymn tune. Let's sing it together. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded lives we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the If you have a watch on, those of you who still wear watches, I invite you to take it off for this hour of worship. As much as I love Dr. Casey Church, I promise not to do what he did last week and use you taking your watches off to go an extra hour in our worship service. I promise I won't do that. I'll watch the time. I can, I can, Tim and I were talking about multitasking as pastors before church began. And we, you often just have to do the both and. Yeah. I'm practicing Sabbath with you, and this is my job. <laughs> so, you're, you're supposed to not work on Sabbath, so I have found a way to do that. I am present with you, and I can take care of the things that you would otherwise worry about. So let, trust me with that. Let that go. If you have a phone, I invite you to turn it off or put it away now. That's for you at home, too. Unless you're using it. Unless you're using it like we are here in, in worship service. That would not be good. That wouldn't work well. In fact, if you look up at that screen every so often, you are our camera operators, folks. And if it looks like it's not going, just tell me to stop and I'll see what's going on. The worst thing you can do is embarrass yourself because it's working fine. <coughs> Now those are the kinds of things, all the details of gathering that we want to just rest in and not worry about. If putting your phone away makes you very anxious, that's okay, even at home. You can try again next week. Maybe you'll be able to do it next week. Just notice the feeling and give it some thought. The feeling of taking a deep breath and being in the moment. And let these simple acts, or maybe not so simple acts, be a sign of the commitment to give ourselves a break, to give ourselves just an hour to catch our breath, to give ourselves time to give God attention. And as I said, don't worry, I'm making sure to watch the time and I'm not taking this as permission to preach longer today. Will you pray this prayer with me? Let us pray a prayer for clearing out. Your, your portion is in the bold text. Spacious God, we come today hoping for tools to sweep away the stress, 
let us make room for you. Nudge us in this time of worship to seek the things that really matter. Let, let us find room for you. Help us to claim our own selves as a holy sanctuary where you dwell. Let us be room for you. In the name of Jesus, who invites us to wholeness. Amen. Amen. If you would like to see the words, oh, we don't have that, this one in our handle. This is very familiar and it's easy to follow if you've never sang or prayed it before. This is a prayer song. We're going to invite the one who quiets us to help us do that. <laughs> If you're comfortable, would you um, stand while we sing? Um, if, if you need to sit, that's okay too. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Thank you for taking time to get to know one another a little bit. I'm going to invite you to take time now to actually catch your breath and stop talking. <laughs> uh, and you may be seen. I do a lot of weddings. Uh, when I'm not here at Green Sky Hill, I do a lot of weddings. And when I pronounce a couple and invite them to kiss each other, you know, it's that traditional, you may now kiss one another, or you may now kiss the bride, or some variation of that. I often have to say, you may now stop kissing the bride. <laughs> <laughs> Each Sunday, as we start a new uh, hanging out time with our children's pastor, Pastor Sarah, when we have kids in the sanctuary, she'll invite them up uh, to chat 
This morning, it looks like that will be online with families who have kids at home. And we'll uh, introduce this time as Sarah's coming forward with this familiar uh, traditional hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. And I'll invite you to sing that uh, together as Sarah comes. Thank <laughs> you. 
these breaks as well. <laughs> and as we go into our week, just remember to, to not feel so overwhelmed, to not feel like you have to control every little bit of everything that's going on in your life. And when you are taking that time for peace, you are taking that mindfulness, you are taking those spirit breaths that we like to take together, take those moments every day and let things settle. Let God be in control. Let's pray. Take time to be holy. Speak often with the Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing, God's blessing to seek. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sarah. It's the unintentional moments that are the best. <laughs> <laughs> All of that was very helpful. Thank you. I guess they trained us in seminary a uh, hundred years ago uh, that the, you're not supposed to make the worship service about you. When, as the, the pastor, you personally connect deeply with what uh, the people are experiencing and you just get to be part of the people, it's beautiful. My grandkids, my kids especially, my grandkids also know that uh, Grandpa hasn't always done so great with messes. <laughs> and so I knew it was a moment of intense, this is a funny story, but it's also true, that it was a moment of intense spiritual development when my grandsons Ishmael and Moises were playing we were visiting them in Ann Arbor and they were playing with something akin to Sarah's glitter container. I keyed into this re remembrance when she said to glue the top, how important that is. What they were playing with was a very fun, super flexible um, little ball that was full of something soft and flexible and you could squish it every different direction and it was really and you could throw it to each other and catch it, and it would just blob when you caught it. So Ishmael was tossing it to Grandpa. And we passed it back and forth in their little apartment many times. And then, out of nowhere, it blew up. As he threw, as he threw it toward me, it exploded. And <laughs> the entire apartment and all of me was covered with, thankfully, what we figured out was cornstarch in the water. It didn't even stain, but I was like splattered, like every part of me was covered. And Ishmael froze, and his mom, Sarah, who, as a young child, was on the receiving end of dad's angst about messes, froze. <laughs> and I froze, and I wasn't at all upset. I thought it was pretty hilarious and we all started laughing, but there was this tense moment of anxiety with when Ishmael was wondering how Grandpa was going to respond to this. And thanks to the Holy Spirit in all truth, I was able to model um, finding the humor in the things that you can't control. He didn't do that on purpose. Um, it took a long time to clean all that stuff up. And in years past, I would have been really upset about it. But it, there wasn't anything to be upset about, as Sarah shared with us, recognizing I am not in control of this. I'm going to ride it out, keep moving forward. And that's where we're going with our scripture this morning and a message called The Right Tempo. Let me just adjust this feedback. In the New Revised Standard Version, a familiar text, Matthew chapter 11, just a few verses, verses 28 to 30. And let me give you some context. Jesus' first followers were following him, literally, from one hill to another, one river or lake to another, one city to another. And along the way, 
they would stop and he would talk with them. Now we have this collection and it, and it kind of feels like sometimes in the Bible that there's just like Jesus just randomly stopped and started teaching a bunch of people. And, and he kind of did. But mostly it was just in the course of their travels, in the course of their everyday life. They'd be sitting around at a meal. They just finished fishing. Uh, they'd been visiting some fans, one of their family members in one town or another, or someone called asking for help. And in a moment, just like we would experience around the table with someone we trusted and loved, uh, he would start talking. He'd just have a conversation with them and teach them um, how to walk the good road. And one time, in one of those conversations, he recognized this busyness, their version of it. Now imagine, you know, no electronics. But you've got so many animals to clean up, clean up after, our farmers can identify with. So much of your day is consumed by making sure you have something to eat later today and tomorrow. And all of the things that were different in the world at that time. So humanity has been busy since the garden. In fact, that's where God said, y'all need to look at how I do things <laughs> and work for a while, work, you know, get your work done and rest, take a day, rest your animals. Don't, don't even let your workers work on that day. You need to rest. And of course, Jesus grew up with that uh, lifestyle. And somehow in Matthew, and if you read the rest of Chapter 11, you'll have more of the context. Jesus recognized that folks were just flat worn out. They were weary. So we've mostly heard this version, or something close to it in English. Come to me, Jesus said, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I think it's helpful to note that Jesus never actually promised that the yoke would literally be easy. Um, that's a bit of a mistranslation. In this context of yoking oxen, have any of you ever yoked an ox before? You're nodding, Jalen. Um, the translation, when you get two huge work beasts of burden, you know, a attached to one device, if it's not balanced, it's, it's not going to work. And so the literal translation that we have summarized as easy, is better translated well-fitting. So you know, think of that, for my yoke is well-fitting, and my burden is light, because it's shared. I'm not bearing the burden all by myself, I think Jesus was saying. So as we begin our busy series, we discover that each of us has a tempo that fits well. I mentioned earlier that I work with a lot of couples and I often talk about giving one another permission to notice when you're out of balance or headed that way. To actually say it out loud. I would appreciate it if you help me notice to my partner. I would appreciate it, Kathy, if you help me notice when I'm out of balance. And she says, invites the same input from me. And the reason in a, in a couple relationship or any partnership that you want to actually give verbal permission, if you mean it, to those other people in your life, is because we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Married couples know, partners know, <laughs> when their partner is out of balance, often before they do, and they're almost always going to say something about it. <laughs> and if you haven't invited that, it feels like you're being parented, which doesn't work well in a marriage or partnership. If you've invited it, you're probably still going to be defensive because you're out of balance or headed that way. But at least you will feel partnered instead of parented. And I think that's, again, part of what Jesus is sharing with us, that 
each of us has a tempo that fits well for us. And, and when we're out of balance, and that, now that tempo, even in a marriage or in a church, all of the gifts that the Spirit gives to a community so that the community can function with whole life, with fullness of life, um, brings very different personalities and very different tempos. So one person's um, everyday balanced tempo is like full or high speed. And then they crash and rest, and then they up, they're up the next day. And as others of us are, um, you know, we pace, you know, we take, we have a little slower pace in life. And so the, the point of this teaching, I think, is not that you all have to look just like everybody else's tempo, but instead to notice when your healthy life tempo, when your, when your pace of life, when your uh, work-life balance is healthy then you're functioning in your own right tempo and giving other people space to do that. I think the teaching here has another practical application though. It's helpful for us to ask each of us ourselves, what is the tempo for me that energizes me? What is the tempo that gives you life and energy? And what tempo of life feels toxic to you? We started the service by remembering that we live in Western United States of America with this regularly predatory capitalism that teaches kids and all of us from a little from a young age that somehow being busy and being you know showing some kind of productivity creating something producing something um, makes you a better human being when the Sabbath was instituted by the creator of all things, as a reminder that the world does not revolve around your personal productivity. That at least one day a week, if you stop and rest, if you have a daily rhythm, a daily Sabbath rhythm, where you work and you do what you need to do, but you also... Now my wife, Kathy, who couldn't be here this morning because her body's hurting her too much, but hi, Kath, she's watching, and she's talking back to the screen right now as I'm talking about work-life balance. And just, I wish, well, maybe we don't want to all hear what she's saying. <laughs> but she's right. I have struggled with this. Many helpers, pastors and doctors and psychologists and people whose life revolves around making sure other people are healthy struggle with this. Most of you, I'm looking around and looking through the camera into your homes. Don't worry, I'm not Google. I shut off right after the service. <laughs> and I can't really see you. I'm imagining you. We struggle with that balance of, of, win, of and why is that? What is underneath that is, is the reflection this morning. What is driving us to feel like we're not of any value if we're not producing something? If we're just being, we're just present with our partner. And I know if I ask for it, I can get another amen from every partner in, who's listening right now. Would you rather have your partner be present than be producing something? Okay. <laughs> yes. And we would rather be present in the moment, even, you know, whether we're working or resting, but not while we're supposed to be resting, caught up in this self-perception that we're somehow lesser if we're not working. And that's, that's what we're addressing during this whole series. And I think when Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, that's where he was going. So what is the cost when we are out of balance in this area of our lives, when we feel like we're not worth enough, if we're not doing enough, what is the cost of that? In the uh, First Nations version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament, which we have been using regularly at Green Sky Hill, it says the same thing from a different perspective, and I want to share it with you and invite you to take it in. 
And I'd like to invite all of us at this moment to take another breath. And will you please hear these words as if Creator sets free the First Nations name for Jesus is speaking these words to you right this minute. Come close to my side, you whose hearts are on the ground, you who are pushed down and worn out, and I will refresh you. Follow my teachings and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest from your troubled thoughts. Walk side by side with me, and I will share in your heavy load and make it light. The word of the Creator for all of creation. I can't ignore what's going on in the world in a Sunday morning sermon as much as I would often like to, so I need to just take a moment to bring us to some of the pain that some of our siblings around this country are experiencing this week and how their heavy burden needs to be carried by all of us. In her article, The Necessity of Hope, things are bad, they will get worse, but despair has never been an option. Rebecca Traster in The Cut writes about this week's Supreme Court decision. As the court's dissent insists correctly, closing our eyes to the suffering today's decision will impose will not make that suffering disappear. And so, with all this laid out, ugly and incontrovertible, the task for those who are stunned by the baldness of the horror, paralyzed by the bleakness of the view, is to figure out how to move forward anyway. Because while it is incumbent on us to digest the scope and breadth of the badness, it is equally our responsibility not to despair. I want to pause in the quote and acknowledge that even here in church this morning, and certainly online, in the community of those who identify as Christian, not everyone will agree with this perspective. And folks will have strong emotions on both sides. And I want to share from my heart that I have, for most of my Christian life, been in circles for whom the Supreme Court decision was considered wonderful news. That shifted some time ago through life and getting to know those deep, most deeply affected by these types of policies, including my own daughter, whose future in her marriage in an instant was blown apart by this decision. And if you'd like to talk about it and your own view of these issues, I, and I welcome the conversation. And now, back to what the author, Rebecca Traster, said about the decision and our responsibility not to despair. These two tasks are not at odds. They are irrevocably twined. As Dahlia Lithwick wondered just a few weeks ago after the massacre in Uvalde, another clear and awful day, what does it mean, the opposing imperative of honoring the feeling of being shattered while gathering up whatever is left to work harder? It means doing the thing that people have always done on the arduous path to greater justice. Find the way to hope, not as a feel-good anesthetic, but as tactical necessity. The prison abolitionist Mariam Kaba reminds us that hope is a discipline. It is also a political strategy and a survival mechanism. As Kaba has said, it's less about how you feel and more about the practice of making a decision every day that you're still going to put one foot in front of the other and you're still going to get up in the morning and you're still going to struggle. It's work to be hopeful. And in that I hear our practice at Green Sky Hill that we borrowed years ago, 
probably at our origins 190 years ago or so, of the African proverb to put feet to your prayers. So as we pray about what's happening to those most vulnerable and most affected by these decisions here in the United States, we can't give up hope. We must put feet to our actions while we're acknowledging the pain that others are suffering. And to you, Kristen and Marnie, and everyone else affected by this Supreme Court decision, I'm with you, and you're not alone, and there are others, many others, who are with you. Jesus said, come close to my side, you whose hearts are on the ground, you who are pushed down and worn out, and I will refresh you. Follow my teachings and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest from your troubled thoughts. Walk side by side with me, and I will share in your heavy load and make it light. Come close to my side. Walk side by side with me. Family, the right tempo, no matter what your personal pace is, the right tempo for us in this world right now is walking. Walking side by side with Jesus, side by side with those who are brokenhearted. Yesterday in Dan McGee's Celebration of Life, we focused on a psalm that his daughter Kelly identified as representative of his life. And it's the perfect place to end this message. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Even if you feel alone, God is with you always. In the moments you may not think God's near, God's still watching over you. Amen.
I think every Sunday we walk together in weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. And we can do both. We can be really sad about the things that are hurting others and still rejoice at the gifts of life that are all around us. And this morning we'll celebrate uh, just a few minutes by welcoming uh, three of our regular folks who are formalizing their connection and membership this morning. The third part of our service is our response to having listened for God's word. We take care to focus through prayer, offering, and ritual on what's really important, really essential, to lives lived with depth. Maybe you've wondered about this rocking chair that usually sits in Susan Hall that's sitting up in front this morning. I'm going to relocate there in a minute, just for a minute. If you've raised kids or are raising children, or even if you haven't or aren't, you've heard of a timeout. We give a timeout when a break is needed. Perhaps we need to think about the consequences of an action, or we just need to break the intensity. Perhaps we're spiraling emotionally and need some perspective. Perhaps we just need to get quiet so we can change the course of action. In this series, we are giving ourselves a time out and are sending ourselves to the prayer chair. If I fall asleep, continue without me. <laughs> this will be a time for letting go of the things we do not need that are weighing us down. Sometimes known as confession, assurance, and petition in a Christian worship service. These three ways of reconnecting with God are ancient and just make so much sense. In confession, we let go of regret about the past, unburdening our hearts. Then we remember the promise and assurance that God will never abandon us, no matter what. Even when Sometimes we are the ones who've been distant. And in petitions, we let go of worry about the things we cannot control and worry about the future, giving it all to the loving God who holds us and rocks us gently. My hope is that each of you will designate a chair at home and find time each day to give yourself time out in your prayer chair to let go, remember God's presence, and ask God to hold all those you hold dear. So let's start with some silence. And it's okay not to try to find words to fill that silence in your head. And it's okay if thoughts won't quiet down. Just find a stillness, perhaps calling attention to your feet on the floor, or your hands in your lap, and your breath in and out. <clears throat> there is nothing expected of you now. There is nowhere to go, nowhere to be. This stillness, this being, is enough.
forward each week, we'll try to stretch that silence a little bit longer. Most of us don't do that very well, especially in a group of people. I didn't time it, it was probably about 20 seconds, but it may have felt like an eternity for some of you. But we're gonna, we'll, we'll work on that together. Will you sing to the same melody this, this prayer again? Silence is a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being, touches face, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. Let us pray. Namada. For the times when we have run ourselves and others ragged, forgive, forgive us. us. For the times when we have asked of ourselves too much or too little, forgive, forgive us. us. Help us find the right tempos for the right times, O oh God. Help us to be gentle in our learning and growing with ourselves and with others. Help us to step back when the toxic and overbearing pace of life that we believe we must adhere to in order to live up to some external ideal threatens to tear down our connections to life to love and to you. In this moment, we hear your promise. Walk side by side with me and I will share in your heavy load and make it light. You do not ask us to destroy ourselves in order to please you. We are your children created by you with whom you are pleased just because. As we light candles in the same way that many of our ancestors offered tobacco or sema in the Anishinaabe Moen language, or incense as physical prayers, we bring our petitions to you, O oh God. In our silence, we bring people and things we are worried about and situations we cannot control. Let us continue in prayer. Oh God, maker of heaven and earth, you uphold the cause of the oppressed. Liberate those who are unjustly treated and those imprisoned by their prejudices, that there may be peace and goodwill among your people. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As I continue to light candles, I invite you to name in your heart those people and those situations that would take your rest away from you. Name them in your heart and let them go, knowing our loving Creator is holding them.
So on page 33 um, is the um, remembrance of our baptism and the welcoming of new members into Green Sky Hill. So we all have a part in this. Even if you're visiting and this is not your home church, there are some um, commitments in here that you uh, should feel free uh, to make. But please, as I shared with one of our new members before the service, um, we never want people to say something that's not coming from their own heart and their own convictions. So if you are following along and you see a response, 
And you're not sure yet, you, you could just stay silent on that particular response. Uh, but if you are sure in the I do's and the I will's, then please uh, say them out loud as we uh, join together. Uh, beginning on page 33, and we will skip a few sections, so just try to follow. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without a price. Through confirmation, through the reaffirmation of your faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So I present this morning Kelly Sue, Jalen Warner, and Mark Osterhaus to reaffirm their faith and to join this congregation as members. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, reply as indicated, I do. I do. And this is for all to join in if you are ready to make these commitments. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the Church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's Holy Church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I will. Do you, as Christ's body, the Church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. We, we do. do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With, With God's God, help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, and we will leave out the bracketed portions of these responses in just the first response to each question this morning. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water, and the flood you set in the clouds. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom from the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. And now on the second, on page 37, uh, at section 12. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Amen. Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Congregation responds, Amen. 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 The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The Holy Spirit work within you that you may being born through water and the Spirit you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now is our joy to welcome, you can turn that around, folks, our new sisters and brothers in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. 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 
as members of Christ Universal Church, I'm on page 38, folks. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I will. Members of the Household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love and respond with me. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Amen. So during coffee hour in a moment, I encourage you to extra make sure they're okay with whatever greeting, hug or handshake or, or fist pump, but welcome these folks into our community. Thank you. final movement of our service is a time of committing to take a bit of this serenity and peace out into the busy world. We are reminded to keep the main thing the main thing. Will you sing Christmas in July with me? Well, it's not quite July, but Christmas in June with me. Uh, and if you are able to stand, this is the closing portion of our service. journey 
be just right. May you seize the day, but also savor the moment. May your life be the one you live, and not just watch passing by. And may you be reacquainted each day with an unhurried God who is calling you to dive deeply into love. Amen. We have one last verse, and then we can head over to coffee and fellowship, or wherever you need to be today. In the Spirit, let us travel, open to each other's pain.